you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Luke chapter 11, in the very first verse, the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but, to, but deliver us from evil. I'd like to preach, Lord be my helper, on some things Jesus prayed for. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you uh, for the ones that you've sent our way this morning. We praise you for that. Lord, we thank you that there's no one here without your divine appointment. And we understand and know that and give you praise because it is that way. Lord, we pray this morning that you would allow us to be put aside for a time. Lord, the things in the world, the emotions and the fears that you put us aside this morning. And that we might focus in for a little while on your word, Lord. That it might speak a rich life to us once again. And we would praise you for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, a little bit uh, different most of the time when you hear the Lord's Prayer, as it's known. You hear Matthew's Gospel, and the wording is a little bit different, but it means the exact same thing. But Luke puts a little bit different twist on it and gives us some information that not necessarily Matthew gave us. And it says in the very first verse, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place. Now you will find again and again and again the Lord Jesus Christ praying and praying and praying. Now there's really two reasons. Number one, he had never been buckled by the flesh. And he could always go to the Father previously and just say, Father. And speak to him face to face and direct to direct. And here we find that he is confined in one sense to the flesh. Now with that said, he was always in a condition to pray. That is our problem and our big hindrance today is we do not find ourselves in a condition to pray. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And the older I get, the more I understand He was not made of the same stuff that we're made out of. He did not have that element of sin that seemingly sometimes consumes us and, and will cause a, a lying heart and will cause us to have ungodly thoughts. He did not have that element. And so He was always in a, an instant and ready to pray. Now, also, He wasn't pulled aside when He was praying about the things of this world. When He was praying, the things of this world did not matter to Him because He was focused on the King. And it came to pass that as He was praying in a certain place when He was ceased, now, it did not say how long he prayed. And my suggestion is it was a long time. We will see uh, one of his prayers lasted throughout the night. Uh, one of his prayers was an all-nighter, so to speak, where he prayed uh, to select his apostles, knowing full well one was the betrayer, and knowing full well that one would be, uh, the Bible says he was a devil from the beginning, and selecting him out of that group, he was praying about that. And so, whatever amount of time transpired, the disciples were there actively listening to 
to prayer. Now that's what we should be doing for our children and grandchildren is them listening and actively understanding with prayer. And they, you know what? There were probably times when he said nothing at all and they were, they were watching a spirit of prayer. My question to you, does anybody at all see that in you? Now, we will talk a little bit about hindrances in a minute, but the Lord didn't suffer them. And so, He was praying and His, and his disciples were watching. And something impacted them because they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, I'm not believing that they didn't pray previously, but they probably did see the inadequacy of, of their prayer up to then. You know the Jewish had. The Jews had long. Uh, Pre-rehearsed prayers. Much like the Catholics do today. And it wasn't that they didn't know. What praying was. But they saw something different. In his prayer. Than their prayer. Now a prayer person. Uh, a people. Uh, a person that is given to prayer. Is just different. They are just a different kind of people. And I have prayed and prayed that the Lord might give me a spirit of real prayer. Uh, where I would be so concerned about my family and about my testimony and about this church that the Lord has given me to pastor. That I would really understand what prayer was all about. And so I want you to see uh, that he was uh, interested in that. I also want you to see... It says one of his disciples. Now what a blessing it would be to know which one said it. Now, the best I understand, the apostles had not yet been selected. And even if they were, he was enlarging this to his disciples, meaning possibly the apostles and others. One of them said, teach us to pray. Now, my question to you this morning, are you that one that would stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and say, teach me how to pray? Teach us as a church, as a unit, as New Testament Baptist Church, teach us to pray. Now, again, from whatever they saw and whatever they heard, they realized an inadequacy in their prayer. They realized there was something missing in what they done. Teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when you pray, say. Now, I do not believe this was something to be chanted. I do not believe that this was something to be repetitious. Uh, I do not believe that uh, there's nothing wrong with saying the Lord's Prayer. And even in that, I think there's a little question. Uh, it wasn't the Lord's Prayer, it was an example. The Lord's Prayer had already ended. And he was just giving them an example. And he was just telling them some, uh, some pointers, so to speak. And he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Now, I want you to see, this was, a, this was a different thing in one sense, because we really can't even go to the Father except on the merit of some sacrifice. The way they prayed was that there would be a, a sacrifice, turtle doves, or the annual, or the annual offering of the sacrificial lamb. Whatever, whatever it was, they they had something in hand to go to the Father. Isn't it a blessing this morning that we don't have to take anything in our hand to approach the mighty great God Jehovah, but rather under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can approach Him anytime we please. Anytime we get ready and go before Him in prayer. When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Uh, that means set apart. That means holy. Uh, when you approach hallowed ground, dedicated to the service, there's nothing magical about church buildings, but this one's been dedicated to the Lord and for His work that makes it hallowed. Hallowed, set apart, different, powerful, good be thy 
thy name. Now there really isn't no mind you can say, hallowed be their name, except uh, be your name, except you recognize you're approaching God. You know what? I dare say most of the people that pray today don't take the magnificence in that they're approaching the very God of all the universe, the one that spoke this place into being. You know what? The one we have no right even to look at. The one that could snub us out in a thought. We don't realize what we're approaching. I think if we did, we'd be a little more reverent. I think if we did, we'd be a little bit awed about standing in the presence of the King. Standing in the presence of the great God Jehovah. So he says, recognize how holy he is. Thy kingdom come. And whether we uh, want to be ready, whether we're ready or not, His kingdom is coming. For a thousand perfect years He'll reign. The Lord Jesus Christ will, will reign from Jerusalem. And that will be the epicenter of all the earth. And He, he looked forward to that time. You know, we... Uh, you know what we don't like about kingship and what the reason we don't understand it is we don't like to be ruled. That's, that's, we don't like to be under anybody else's authority but ours. And uh, in a kingship situation, if he says, John, the only thing you can say is how high would you like me to jump? How high can I get it up for you? What would you like me to jump over? Tell me what more that you want. How would be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. In other words, he's all the power. Whatever he wants done gets done. Give us day by day our daily bread. Now, I do not believe that this was praying for food. I do not believe he was offering a blessing on food. But rather he's saying, you pray that you hear from God every day. You pray that you get some little smackerel of a morsel from God on a routine, everyday basis. But and yes, well, where did you come from that? He said, uh, the reason why, he says, the Word of God is our daily bread. You see all kinds of little pamphlets out there uh, that says daily bread. You know where that comes from? It comes from the book of Psalms. That is the daily bread. Uh, in other words, don't you don't be praying for a T-bone steak, but be praying that you might hear a little bit from this each day. And not just run, run through here uh, in your patient, possess ye our souls. Move on to the next thing. Know that you might hear from God. Just a little smile. Just a little something that you might get on a daily basis, on a routine day, give us our daily bread. And I'll say that with this. He's the one that gives it. It's His to give. And you say, well, uh, we got it right here in front of us. Well, the Holy Ghost don't mingle with it. No, you don't. You have empty pages. If He don't meet with you and don't make it alive, He says, my word is a living word. If He don't meet with you and make it alive, it's no longer living. And so what you need is Him to mingle Himself with it and present it to you on a daily basis. That's, that's, that's when you really, really meet with God. And I tell you what, this word is under attack. I've never seen the King James Bible so attacked as it has been in the last years. And I'm talking among our people, people that I would have never dreamt that would be in, in, in really opposition to this book. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. Now, uh, never quite understood that until recently because you know what? Our sins are forgiven. They're paid for. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When he, when he died on Calvary and said it's finished, that was it. They were, they were blotted. They were done. So why in the world would he say, I want you to pray, forgive us our sins. When we know that they're, they're paid for, they're blotted. Well, it's really for you. You need to remember on a daily basis where you violate God's word and where you violate his character. 
And I'll say this, if nothing else, on a routine basis, we violate His holiness and we violate His forgiving spirit. Because we like to crudge around stuff for years and years and years. And what we should do is say, I forgive. Throw it off and move on. That, that, that's, what, that's what we need to do. And, and, and so we see there in this, in this situation, he, he not only says that, he says you need, you need, to, uh, you need to be a, a for, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, meaning he can. If you ask him not to, he has the power to do it. But deliver us from evil. Now, two things about that. Number one, again, he can give us over to the tempter, or he can lead us into temptation, according to this, and he also can deliver us from evil. You know what that says to me? There are going to be situations where you're going to be placed in the epicenter of evil things. You know what? We don't even understand the evilness of this world. And I'm not talking about Hillary Clinton, although I compare her to Jezebel and worse. But I'm talking about even today. You know what he said to the church at Pergamos? I know where Satan's seat is. Could you imagine if a moment like Gehazi, if our eyes were open and we could see the, the glory of the angels that meet with us and at the same time the terror of the devils that's come to oppose. Right. It, it, it would shake us to the bottom of our feet. And so we see he asked that knowing, knowing that those two things were very a very realistic thing that could happen. That was our Example prayer. Go with me back to Luke 6. We made a little reference to this earlier, but we'll read it again. Luke 6 and verse 12. Luke, Luke 6 and verse 12. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. Now, I want you to see every time that you see the Lord Jesus Christ praying, He's flying solo. He's by Himself. <clears throat> he is in a place where He can find God. And the reason that is, is there's interruptions in the day. There's interruption. And listen, <clears throat> we are told in the Bible that all food is to be received with thanksgiving, and it is doing away with the old Jewish dietary law. Nothing wrong with adhering to that, but it's not necessary. It's clean if we if we receive it with thanksgiving. But listen, that's not the type of prayer that I'm talking about. Should we do it? You betcha. But listen, three times a day, praying for the meals that are set before you, that is not prayer of life. Here in this situation, he, he makes it very, very clear. He makes it very, very specific that he went out by himself. And it came to pass in those days that he went into a mountain. Now, I recently told you that I climbed my first mountain. And my legs and my legs have been sore ever since. It wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't an easy process. And uh, my son Matthew, being the way that he is, he said, "Dad, you can stay down here, and, and we're going up." Well, that was just all I needed to hear. I, I, I'm going with you, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't it wasn't pleasant. The only thing that I would say that thrilled my heart was the view from the top. It was incredible. It was beautiful. It, it, was, it would be beyond what I could describe to you. And he says that the Lord Jesus went, you know what? He climbed up that mountain. I don't know where it was. I don't know what kind it was. But he went to a mountain apart to pray. You know, sometimes our prayer place is very difficult to get to. It's very hard to reach. And I mean that in a spiritual sense. I don't want you to... I don't want you necessarily to go climb a mountain if you want to take off. But getting into a spirit of prayer is not easy. 
because of constant interruptions of the day that we have. Our, our cell phones constantly going ding, ding. Our, our, our electronic devices are consuming us. They really are. And, and, and so we see then that because of the demands of this world and what we set before us, listen, a mountain is what we need to climb to pray. Get out by yourself. Get alone. Get with the Lord. And continued all night in prayer to God. Now, I want you to see what, what a magnificent thing this is, the time that he spent in prayer to God. In Israel, night was from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., 12 hours in prayer to God, interceding constantly, begging God, uh, getting in line with God's will. And really, that's what prayer is mostly about, is getting in line with what God would have you to do. Putting this flesh aside, and saying, uh, not my will, but thine be done. Just getting, getting in the groove. Now, uh, I don't know, uh, all these other ones that were named, we know James, John, and Peter, those three in the inner circle, we know a great deal about them. We know a great deal about Judas Iscariot. We know a little bit about Thomas. The other seven we don't know a whole lot about. Did you ever think about that? All we know is that they were there. Now, as she's before the Lord praying, can you imagine him saying, I want you to choose Thomas? And immediately, you know, the Lord knew Thomas' character. Thomas is a doubter. Thomas is not effective. Thomas is not doing his job. Choose Thomas. Choose Bartholomew. What? He's a regular, everyday, routine at best. Choose Bartholomew. You see what I'm talking about? Getting in line with the, with the will of the Lord. You know what? I don't necessarily think that Judas was too hard to select because he knew Judas' purpose. But these routine seven mediocre, just, you know, you hear from them and, and you never hear from them again. I bet they were hard to select. I bet when God says, this is the, these are the twelve that you need, that it was a very difficult thing to say, okay, this sounds good to me. And when it was day, again all night, he called unto him his disciples, and to them he chose twelve who he named apostles. And so I want you to see that, that your ideas about great and your ideas about effective may not be what God's idea is the same. You know what? Someone that is the most mousy, uh, introvert, may be God's choice for you. The, the, the most, uh, uh, the most uh, unassuming individual may be the very one that God has chosen to do a great work. And you know what? What I have found is those little uh, mousy individuals struggle a great deal with finding God's will. Especially if it's called to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they just can't imagine themselves in that position. It takes prayer. It, it, it takes saying, <clears throat> not my will, Lord, but thine be done. It takes a great deal. So we see that one example of prayer was that to make difficult, hard decisions. Making difficult, hard decisions. That is one thing you need to spend time in prayer. Is where you're, what, when there's major decisions to be made, buying a house, buying a car, find, helping to find a mate for your children, spend some time in prayer. Twelve hours. I dare say most of our prayers on a good day is it one in 12 minutes? Much less 12 hours. 12 hours just simply 
Lord, you tell me which one. And I believe immediately it's Bartholomew, John, um, uh, Andrew, Peter. I believe he spit them off right, you know, one, two, three, four. I think the prayer was saying, okay, this is what you want. I'll call, I'll call them. This is the list you desire. You know, what, but what I have found in my life of preaching, it's not so much knowing God's will, it's accepting God's will. When we pray for deliverance of a loved one out of disease, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. What do we immediately pray for? Please, Lord. God, please. You know what it is? It's accepting it. I'll tell you another thing, and I'm not a prophet. You don't have to call me Prophet Larry. But I knew Judy was going to make it. I told her the first day we got home from the hospital, I said, Judy won't live. And you know what I prayed? I prayed she'd be delivered. Knowing that she wouldn't. So what I needed was not a prayer, was not a prayer uh, of change things, Lord. It was acceptance and may her days be comfortable. Whatever she's got left, might it be effective for you? You know, that's the problem today. Is you're not going, if God is sovereign and we say we believe that, you're not going to change his mind. Right. So what do we need to pray for? Just say, Lord. I'll accept it. So 12, 12 hours in prayer to the Lord Jesus. Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 26. Matthew 26 and verse 38. And then he, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell down on his face, and prayed, and said, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup from me, <laughs> let, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. I want to I wanna notice two things. First of all, his humanity. Uh, and again, I can't get my own mind around this because I think his flesh was different than our flesh. I really do. But, do you think he liked knowing what the will of God was when he's part of God himself? Certainly not. Whatever his flesh, what role it ever played, it was accepting it. So sometimes we just need a prayer of acceptance. God, if this is your will, let me be effective in the situation. If this is your will, let me accept it and move on. If this is your will, let it be even so unto me. That's what we need. That, and, and then whatever's left, wherever we're at, whatever is our locale, at the done, serve God from that standpoint and that, and, and that, uh, and that effectiveness. Now, uh, I'm not going to read the rest of this, but you know, he went back three times. And, and what's interesting is uh, in Matthew's gospel, it says, what? Could you not watch with me one, one hour? Again, and he does this three times showing us it was a three-hour prayer. He spent time in prayer. Now, I will say this. All he said in Matthew is, watch while I go yonder to pray. In the Gospel of Luke, he says, watch and pray while I go yonder. So we find two things that are very, very connected. Watching and praying. You got your eyes, and we should because things is changing quickly. You got your eyes on politics, and I, I, I look a little bit at it, and then I watch and pray. I watch and look at it. Listen, what are you going to do when you say, they say, listen, if you don't get this little chip, you don't get your social security chip. If you don't take this little chip, and listen, I'm a, I'm a Tennessee government employee, you don't get your check. 
what are you going to do? And I know I've said that for five or six years, but I'm telling you again, and as a caboose, I'm telling you, watch and pray. Watch and pray. And so we find then that we as the Lord's people need to take His example. And in the earnestness of our prayer too, the Bible says just a little further down, it says, and He prayed so there were, there were, that He sweat great drops of blood. That He was so into His prayer. He was so near unto God and His flesh was so afflicted that He began to pray, bleed through His skin. Now when that said, uh, to pray effectively sometimes we have to afflict this flesh. That's what fasting is all about. Fast ye and pray ye one for another. Fasting is a New Testament teaching very, very clearly. Don't, don't let anybody tell you that that's in the Old Testament. That that was done with, with the cross of Calvary because it wasn't. And uh, I say another place, and the one I quoted to you is in Peter, and another one is in Acts, before we send someone out, he says, lay hands on them, fast, lay hands on them, and pray. And then send them out, send them on their way. Now, uh, when, when, when we think about that and we see that, that, that fasting has to be a piece of prayer and earnestness has to be a piece of prayer. Now, I've heard a lot of commentary and a lot of ideas about sweating what great drops of blood. And you uh, would you believe that it is a true thing in the physical body and it's brought on by unbelievable stress? It is a real event that does happen. So that says to me that he was very, ver very burdened down with the will of God. And more so than that, you and me. He, he, he afflicted his flesh. He very deliberately put it aside. He very deliberately. And I will say this, and this will be studied for you this week. This is the first part of him draining his life's blood for you and me. This was the first uh, bit of it. Then he goes into the, the hall and he's beaten. That's the second part. He's uh, Then he is smitten in the crown of thorns. And then ultimately the cross of Calvary. And finally the, the Roman soldier stabs him in the side and the job is done. This was the first piece of it. Was the bleeding of our Lord Jesus Christ. He set that aside to go to the Lord in prayer. Gospel of Matthew. I'm sorry, uh, Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 22, verse 28. Luke 22 and verse 28. The Bible says, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint you, and I appoint you a kingdom as my Father have appointed unto me. And I believe that will be in the millennial reign. <coughs> that ye may eat and drink the table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, and that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for thee, that thy faith fail not. Now I want you to notice two things. Number one, God knows the devil's plan. Remember when concerning the trials of Job, that the Lord God said, If thou considered my servant Job, there's none like him in the earth. And so apparently, something was said about Peter in the great throne room, and it was the devil's desire to sift Peter as wheat, to, to grind him down to nothing. And what was the Lord Jesus Christ's prayer concerning this? That he might be excused from it? That he may not have to go through it? That he might be protected? No, no, that thy faith 
fail not. That not even they might be excused from the event, but that he may go through it and prove his faith, his, his dependence, and his love for Christ. And he says, and when, and when you uh, strengthen the brethren, and when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, I've often thought about that conversion, and I've even, I think, missed the boat on it at times. You know what Peter needed? He needed to be changed. Was Peter saved? I think so. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 18. So what he was praying, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. See, Peter needed to be changed. And you and I do too. We need to be changed from time to time, molded ever, ever more into the image of God's Son. Continually on an ongoing basis, not being saved and, and being resaved and being resaved, but rather being remolded and remolded and twisted and turned into the image that God would have us to be in. He says, when you're converted, when you're changed, when you come through this experience and have learned from it, strengthen the brethren. And I think is really what he gained from that wasn't fulfilled until, until it went out and said, I don't know the man. In John, uh, I believe it's chapter 19, it says that he uh, went out and wept bitterly. See, he was changed. He was, it, it made a difference. It, it changed him. And then he became the very leader of the pastor at the First Baptist Jerusalem. He began to do the work that God had called him to do. Gospel of John. Probably the most powerful thing that I can find in, in the example of prayer because it involves me. John chapter 9 and, and, and uh, uh, excuse me, John chapter 17 verse 9. John 17 verse 9. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them that thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now that, that, that strikes me as a phenomenal thing is this. I deliberately, I pray not for the world. You know, that, 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 that kind of, that kind of, Grabbed me. Should we pray for the world? Probably not. One, th one place Paul says, My hope and prayer for Israel is that she might be saved. He, he was praying for Israel corporately, but he wasn't praying for the world. This world is on a downhill run. And I don't know that we're to pray for it. I really don't. Uh, God's will be fulfilled. I, I, think, I think He's done. I think He's done with the United States. I think He's done with the world globally. We've gone as far as we can go. Verse 10. All mine, meaning His apostles, the ones He would die for, all mine are thine, meaning they are the fathers, and thine, meaning the nation of Israel and those that look forward to Christ, are mine, and I am glorified in them, meaning the whole group, because he was dying for all of them. Now I am no more in this world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own names who thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none have lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And, and now come I to thee, and these things speak in the and these things I speak in the world, that thou might have that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world that hated them, because they are not of the world, and I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy word, it is truth. Drop down to verse 20. 
Neither pray I for these alone, but them also which shall believe on me through the word. Yeah. Jesus prayed for me. Right. On the evening before the crucifixion, he laid it out and said, I'm praying for you. And you know what? The Bible says if my father, if my son, there, I can't deny him. You talk about uh, scripture for security of the believer. That's it. I, he prayed for me and his father will never deny him. Whatever the Father wants, He gives it to me. And, and so He, he uh, prayed for me in this one of His final prayers. In His final prayer in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Now, as many of us think about death, we think about pain. We think about the uncertainty of death. We think about what will bring us to that point. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I'm not really scared of death, but I'm scared about how I might get there. And I can understand that. I, I can see that. I, I certainly don't want to die with cancer. Uh, well, whatever, you know, we, we think of some things being better than others, and I don't know that they are. But what I would like to see as my death was nearing is that I might pray to God. Now, I don't know if this woman was saved. I don't know her condition with God. But there was a gospel singer, and she was a holiness Pentecostal woman named Priscilla McGruder. She was found to have breast cancer. It was stage four when they found it. They treated her for a time. She did well for a time. It came back. She, it is said that she knelt by her bed, and she prayed, and got up and laid down on the bed and died. What a finish up. What a way to be done. That, that, that's what I would like to do. Uh, I'd like to be praying or preaching or singing the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ when He comes for me. So with that thought in mind, look at verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, unto my hands I commend my spirit. Spirit, and having said thus, he gave up the ghost. The last thing the Lord Jesus did was pray. The way he finished up his life was prayer. He was done. He was finished. So, what about your prayer life? And what about my prayer life? And what, what did you start your day with? What, what, what is on your mind as you begin the day? And you prepare yourself for what lays ahead. Prayer should be a priority. It should be a planned time. Now we live in a day and age where our time demands are so much. If you don't plan it, you won't do it. Right? Right? Now, when I say that, I don't mean <clears throat> at 3.30 I'm going to pray and I'm going to be done at 4.30. Because then you're limiting God. You're demanding that He meets with you at this time. Mm -hmm. And you can't demand nothing from God. That, that would reduce His deity, right? That would reduce how much God He really is. And so what we have to do then is be, uh, be in a condition to pray at all times. You, uh, remember, uh, the Bible says, I think in, in the letter to the Thessalonians, pray and cease not. So how can we possibly pray constantly? That's not the effort of the message. The effort is the message is this. You be in a condition to pray all the time. That should be our strive. I know the flesh gets in uh, the way of that. Sure I do. I, I have the same mess you do. But it should be our strive. We should, you know, we should wake up with a song in our heart every day. We, we should be glad He's brought us this far. We should give Him glory and honor just for saving our soul. Just for making us something that He didn't have to. Just, just give Him glory. So how does your prayer life, and I know it doesn't because 
no one's does. But how does your prayer life uh, line up with the Lord's? I'd have to say mine's very sorrowful. I'd have to say mine is nothing to compare. But uh, I wish it was. Mm -hmm.